<laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Ann Jorgensen, and I'm interviewing Himaro Lopez for the Voces, Voces Oral History Project in Austin, Texas. Texas. Today is April 14th, 2017. Thank you for participating in this. Just to make sure you understand, the interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection here at UT. If there is something you don't want to talk about, you don't have to. If there's something you do want to talk about, please speak up at any time. If at any point you need to take a break, let me know and we can briefly stop the tape. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so how would you like to be addressed today? Dr. Lopez? Sure, Do that's okay. fine. That's, that's, uh, I've heard that all, all of my working life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so Dr. Lopez, could you give me an overview about your life as it relates to the changes that came about as part of the South Texas Border Initiative? <sighs> well, I'm an example of the sink or swim type philosophy of teaching in that I uh, didn't know English when I went to first grade. So they threw me in uh, because I grew up on the border. And on the border, Spanish is the dominant language. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I was in first grade that I learned English. And uh, so, but it, I mean, I, I, just, I took to it naturally because I, I, I don't know why, but I did. Because I, I have other friends who didn't. And uh, I mean, these guys were smart and everything, but they couldn't speak English for some reason. And they never made it through the, uh, the labyrinth that, that is uh, set up so that you can become successful in the United States. Because mastery of the language is the absolute number one requirement to be successful in the U.S. Um, and so uh, I managed to, I mean, I got a, a high school degree in Browns, from Brownsville High School. Uh, I went to junior college there in, uh, in Brownsville, Texas Sophomore's College. And then um, from there I went to, I wanted to get as far away as I could, still be in Texas. So I went to Lubbock, <laughs> which is very far away. Uh, and I graduated from there. Luckily, again, th and my Spanish came in handy there because I was able to be in the biology department and be the translator for professors who would go to Mexico to collect, you know, plants and animals and things. Um, none of the other graduate students could speak Spanish. And so, and from there I went on to um, uh, Cornell uh, and got my PhD uh, in entomology uh, and then I came back came back to um, to uh, Texas A&M as my first job but then the 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 border uh, called us back uh, because we wanted to raise our children in a bicultural bilingual environment and that's the border uh, and though I knew that, that, that my, uh, my career was going to take a nosedive, but hey, you have, if you want to be, I figured that we were doing uh, work uh, similar to uh, the Peace Corps, but still in the United States. You know, it's a very poor area the, the, down there. I think Brownsville is the second poorest metropolitan area in the United States, and McAllen's the first. So there we were. But it was, it, 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 it's very, it's very uh, rewarding to be an agent of change in an area that has suffered so, uh, so long economically. It's, it's, it's great. So what was it like growing up for you in Brownsville? Obviously, it had an impact on you if you wanted to raise your kids down there. Oh, Brownsville, uh, when I was growing up, was a beautiful area. I loved fishing and hunting and being outdoors. Uh, I could get on my uh, <clears throat> on my bicycle in junior high, put my 22 rifle across the handlebars and ride out maybe two miles away <laughs> from my house and go shoot some rabbits and bring them home and my mother would cook them for dinner. It was, it <clears throat> I could go fishing in the Rosacas and uh, the water was clear. That was before they had an invasion of uh, carp uh, to stir up the waters. Uh, we could catch a largemouth bass, we could catch brim, we could catch a Rio Grande perch, 
And I mean, we could live off the land. And uh, besides going off to the beach, uh, it was it was a wonderful time. I loved being down and being out outside and being outdoors and just uh, just you know just around like that. Wow! Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, so I guess so. You said that you wanted to go as far away as possible without <laughs> leaving Texas. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, because when when you get to high school, you know, you. You always wanted, to, you don't, I, I never wanted to fit in with a group. I wanted to, you know, be like, because I don't know, I guess for, for a lot of, of uh, people like myself who are of the place, but not in the place, uh, and where you kind of feel like you're not really, you know, uh, a lot of because uh, I compared myself with a lot of my friends and what they wanted to do is they wanted to finish high school and that's it then go to work get married and then just live there and never look outside of the, the Rio Grande Valley but I had uh, you know I, 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 I was looking on the other side of the fence uh, what, what we call the cactus curtain which is the King Ranch <laughs> Instead of the Iron Curtain, we have this curtain that keeps people from traveling back and forth. <clears throat> and I wanted to go and explore the world. Uh, and uh, since, I mean, I didn't have, we, I think we took one vacation when I was growing up uh, with my dad and, and family. I think we went as far away as Corpus Christi, which is 150 miles uh, from Brownsville. Uh, and that, that was it. Uh, other than that, the only way that I could get out of Brownsville was by reading. Uh, and so I was an avid, avid reader of all sorts of uh, different types of literature, especially science fiction. That was one, one of my favorites. During high school, I read at least one science fiction book every two days. And so I would be in class reading my science fiction or reading some other novel of some kind of Bertrand Russell, uh, you know, philosophy or things like that. And I was, th that's how come I was never like a really good student because I was like doing all this stuff over there. It's like I ended up with a B average for high school because eh, I figured now nah, this is like, you know, I want to go and do other things. This is like a small time. And so uh, when I, uh, applied to universities. I had some friends apply here to UT, but I said, no, I want to go further away. Is there anywhere, but it still stay in Texas. And then somebody said, well, there's one in Lubbock. I said, well, I've never been there, so okay, I'll apply. And they accepted me, and I got on the bus, and off I went. Wow, that's... <laughs> That's brave, to say the least. No, no, it's actually, <laughs> I don't know if it was brave, it was just like, uh, it was like, well, I, what can happen, you know? I mean, hey, nothing bad ever happened to me, let's, uh, let's go. So uh, we, uh, we went. So if you went. had had the opportunity to stay in the area for your own higher education? There was no, well, there was, there was one in Edinburgh, but uh, no, I didn't, I didn't want to stay with uh, the, the locals. Uh, I wanted to go, you know, I wanted to, you know, move on and uh, uh, experience new things and, and different things, different people also. Um, one thing I do remember, uh, I always wondered why I, I always sat in the front row. And so in high school, uh, one of my teachers said, hey, you know what, maybe you need glasses. I said, no, I don't need glasses. Oh, I know what it was, I know what it was. Uh, a, a friend of mine and I were out um, hunting, again, on the levee. Th and this is now where UTB is located today. The, the levee uh, was where we used to go. Because I, I lived in that neighborhood and we would ride our bicycles out there. And my friend Craig said, hey, I'm going to shoot that sign over there. And I said, what sign? And he said, this one. And he went, blink, blink. And I said, oh my God, maybe I do need glasses. Maybe that teacher is right. So I went and got glasses. And then I walked out after I got my glasses. This was in 11th grade. And I looked up and I saw that palm trees actually had leaves. 
they weren't just like a blob of green on top of a stalk. And, uh, and that, that helped me a lot uh, <laughs> so that I, could, I was actually able to see, you know, uh, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> That, I can see how that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, so what made you want to pursue a career path in the sciences? Um, <clears throat> at that time, Sputnik had just happened, and so the U.S. was putting a lot of emphasis on science education. Um, we were running scared from the, from the Russians, and uh, I had a, a ninth grade... Uh, so, I'm sorry, eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade science teacher from Buffalo, New York, um, Mr. Beimler, Ted Beimler, who had us enthralled with the, with the stories about how scientists worked, what they discovered, how they thought. Uh, for instance, one time he, and, and I remember this so clearly, he took a paper bag and he folded it over and he passed it around to everybody. He said, okay, guess what's in there? So everybody would, you know, pass it around and jiggle it and all that. And he had, okay, now everybody write what you think was in there, you know. And so we all wrote and they said, you know how to be really sure? You open the bag and you look in it. He said, otherwise you're just guessing. He said, science looks in the bag. And so I said, wow, I want to do that, you know, for, for, the, for life. And uh, so that, you know, turned me to the science. Um, there was a lot of, of other peer, my, uh, my friends who were into science. Um, Juan Guevara uh, ended up being a biochemist. Um, uh, Willie Blyer ended up uh, being an uh, animal, uh, I think it was animal geneticist. Uh, I ended up becoming an entomologist. There was a lot of that. It wasn't so much pushing toward becoming a, a medical doctor, it was toward becoming a scientist. And so the, the environment that I grew up in, in, in high school, was toward pushing us toward science. It's, not the, it's no longer here. Yeah, that, I mean, that's cool that the education pushed you to that. So was Brownsville's education I guess supportive of the students and like bilingual <coughs> education. Uh, no, there that. wasn't any bilingual. I got spanked for speaking Spanish uh, in uh, first grade. But I mean, come on, you're out on the baseball field, and <laughs> my friend Enrique Henry <laughs> wouldn't throw me the ball. I was the catcher, and so I yelled at him in Spanish. You know, because that's the quick. It's amazing how when you have to th translate from Spanish to English and then back again. It slows things down. So to get the ball faster, I yelled at him in, in Spanish. And of course, one of the teachers reported me. I got pulled into the principal's office and they said, we don't, we don't, want, we don't like to do this, but we're going to have to spank you because uh, our rule is no speaking Spanish on the, on the playground. And so I got three whacks. Uh, but and it's OK. It was, they weren't very strong whacks. Well, that's. An unfortunate just that they would do that considering it's on the border but I guess did you have any mentors like through your college or just like lower uh, education that pushed you to I don't know follow the sciences and <clears throat> you know keep being you um, mentors uh, I think I, all that my teachers were really, really supportive and real. I didn't have, well, I had one ma bad math teacher. She would um, paint her nails <laughs> up there, and we were over there blabbing away. And as I come up, I was never really, really good in, in algebra, but it's okay. You know, but other than that, I mean, we had, I took two years of Latin in high school. Uh, I took, uh, Advanced. I, I didn't get calculus, but I had trigonometry. Uh, the trigonometry teacher was absolutely wonderful. Uh, my chemistry and my physics teachers were great, and I had this giant crush on my biology teacher. Um, poor thing, she. Um, but she had. <laughs> she set me up for this um, uh, sort of embarrassing uh, incident. 
she had this very heavy uh, Spanish accent. <clears throat> and so we were studying uh, sea animals, and there was uh, an aquarium. We had a saltwater aquarium, and there was the sea anemones, you know, where like ne little Nemo lives, the, the little animal the, the, with the tentacles. And she called those sea anemones because that's how it's spelled. So I learned it like that. Then many years later when I was uh, on the bus uh, going from Lubbock to, uh, to Ithaca, New York where Cornell is, we, I, had to t I had to take the bus to New York City and there was a layover to take the smaller buses. It went up to the up, upstate to the smaller towns. And so I had a little layover and I met this uh, girl from, from New York City who was also going to Cornell. <clears throat> so we were walking around and uh, we would pass the saltwater cream and I said, look, see anemones. And she laughed. And, so, <laughs> and she said, no, what did you say? The, 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 those are anemones. And so I have quickly learned that <laughs> you have to dominate the language to, 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 be, <laughs> to be taken seriously. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I, I thought that was funny. <laughs> so, okay, so you decided to go to Lubbock and mm -hmm. Texas Tech because yeah. you wanted to get farther away from Brownsville. Yes, uh, one, of, one of my teachers suggested uh, there at, at Texas Southmost College had graduated from Lubbock and he said, well, this is a very uh, clean city and, it's very, and, and the people are very nice and everything. I said, and I did find that the people were very nice up there. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, you know, I mean, there was, if I remember the figures right, there was 18,000 students and 16 Hispanics in the whole school. Uh, but nobody, you know, I mean, we didn't, we didn't know any different. I didn't know any different because, you know, growing up in the valley uh, in, in Brownsville, I never thought of myself as a minority being um, discriminated against. I never felt that growing up in Brownsville. Uh, <clears throat> whereas I have, now I have some friends who grew up in, in places like uh, East Texas, uh, I'm sorry, uh, West Texas, uh, and they felt it. But I never felt that. I felt that <clears throat> <clears throat> we were all people. Um, I mean, I had friends from all 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 colors. All uh, there was there wasn't very many black people there. There was a few black, um, uh, maybe of, of the six hundred that graduated, there was maybe a dozen black people. There was a there was a couple of Asians, uh, but most people most were Hispanics and and white, and we got all everybody got. I mean, we never. You know, we didn't feel any, any racial tensions. I mean, it wasn't until later, than, like when I went to New York and stuff like that, that I, that I, that I discovered that was, a, that was a thing. So you didn't experience anything like that while you were at Texas Tech? You know, I, I, if I did, I didn't know it. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure that... Uh, and... and, and the deal is that when I worked for uh, Dr. Robert Baker at Texas Tech, he celebrated the, the, he was from Arkansas, and he celebrated the fact that I could speak Spanish because I was very useful to him. Uh, we, he took me to the Amazon, he took me to uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, because nobody else could speak Spanish, you know, and so I was, he trained me how to do chromosomes, <clears throat> how to do, how to get, uh, you know, take pictures and, and how to actually extract the chromosomes from different uh, mammals. And so I was, you know, I was his technician and his translator. So I did two for one. <laughs> okay, wow. Yeah. So did Dr. Baker have was he the first one to kind of, I guess, celebrate that? Since you said that you got you yes. spanked. Um, oh yeah, I got yeah. <laughs> um, actually, and then I had I had a sixth grade teacher 
uh, not um, I forgot her name right now. I'm thinking of somebody else um, who actually helped me a lot. Also, um, Mrs. Eckhoff, Jean Eckhoff, and she she was very uh, she was like from the Midwest and very supportive of uh, of us children uh, in the sixth grade to to actually integrate and to become uh, successful. It doesn't matter what, she, she actually had big influence like that. And then my junior college teacher, uh, Barbara Warburton, was very uh, successful, especially when she found out not only could I, I mean, because a lot of people could speak Spanish, but that I was also able, handy with, uh, with cars, because we needed to, uh, <coughs> we had, we would take field trips from Brownsville down to the rainforest in, uh, in Tamaulipas, uh, and we were driving w war surplus, uh, Korean war surplus uh, power wagons, Dodge power wagons, uh, not power wagons. Um, well, they were four-wheel drive military surplus. And a lot of times these things broke down, and we were out in the middle of nowhere in, in Mexico, and we had to fix them, and I could do that. I remember one time, <clears throat> where, I mean, because the curves are really, you know, uh, hairpin curves, one time the brakes went out in the front wheels. So we pulled over and uh, so everybody was scratching their head trying to figure it out and I, f I found out that it was one side was locked, the other side was working fine. So I cut the line to that one, bent it over and hammered it shut and said, okay, let's go with three brakes and we made it. <laughs> We finally got up to the, to the uh, they had an extra uh, wheel cylinder when we get up to the top of the mountain. And then we were able to change it up there and then reconnect the line. So when did your, like, I guess, efficiency with cars come about? Because uh, my dad <coughs> was um, uh, auto parts. He, he, during World War II, he was in the supply. Okay? And so after he got out, he, uh, he, was, he worked in auto parts for all his life. And uh, when I was in going from junior high to high school, um, I was, you know, looking out, out of the window of our little house one day, and I saw this uh, tow truck come towing a green 1953 Plymouth. This was 1962, okay? So I was a little bit, little 11 years old, or one, and park it and then drive off. And I looked out and I said, wow! That's a beautiful, it was a beautiful deep pearl green, you know. So I went out and I said, wow, and it had, you know, it had, in those days there was no power steering, just big old white steering wheel. So I sat in it, you know, and, and the keys were there, and so I turned it, and I had nothing. I said, ah, the battery's dead probably, but so I was playing. And then the dump truck, I mean the tow truck comes back and passes around like this and backs up, and it has an engine dangling from the hook. And, so, and my dad was riding the passenger. He comes over and he opens the hood up like this, straight up, and has the guy back up and drop the engine into the, <laughs> into the car. And my dad said, there's your car, put it together. So he and I put it together. And so I learned how, how to put cars, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Okay, dad, <laughs> he said, you got three months, you know, all summer, so you're gonna go to high school. <laughs> well, there's that sink or swim mentality. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so fast forwarding a bit, how did you decide to go to Cornell for your doctorate? It was an accident. I was all set. Dr. Baker had graduated from the University of Arizona. <clears throat> so he had set it up with his professor for me to go study there for my graduate degree. But a friend of mine at, at the house that I lived in, uh, we were renting, I lived in the basement. And, and, a, and a, I think he was from Houston. He, was, he lived upstairs. He said, man, I got this application to Cornell. I mean, they're all scientists. He says, I got this application to Cornell, but it costs 20 bucks. I don't have 20 bucks. I said, ah, I have 20 bucks. I just got paid. Let me have it. Filled it in, saved the world, ecology, you know. I, I, I was the, um, on the first Earth Day, I was the president of the Beta 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 Biology Honor Society. So in 19, 
70, the very first Earth Day, I was one of the campus leaders. Okay, and uh, so I've ah, saved the world, you know, ecology, la 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 la, BS, BS, send it all. Okay, three weeks, about a month later, I get a phone call from uh, Dr. Pimentel, I forgot his first name, at Cornell saying, we like what, you, what you've written, uh, we're glad to see that you have applied, we'll pay for, we'll give you a research assistantship. All you have to do is come here, do your research uh, in my laboratory. So I said, so I went to, 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 <laughs> to uh, Dr. Baker and I said, what do I do? He said, give me that, and that one from Arizona and threw it in the trash. He said, you go to Cornell. So I did. And that's how I ended up there. Just, just because I filled in this application, you know, and <laughs> did a good job of writing that I was going to save the world. And then I'm still trying to save the world, but it's a long slog. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, so did you notice, what kind of differences, I guess, did you notice going from Lubbock to New York? For it was much colder <clears throat> um, and much, much a uh, higher quality of, uh, of, uh, of intellectual discussions, um, a lot harder studying. Uh, when I got up there, uh, they gave me a, a test and they said, oh, so you're deficient in a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> Apparently, people from the Ivy League think that uh, from the Mississippi West is like, you know, full of barbarians. <laughs> Or, you know, just whatever. They said, and so they said, you need to take this, these, these. And so I had to take a bunch of undergraduate courses, which is okay. So that's why it took, well, it's one of the reasons it took me five years to get my PhD instead of four. But it's okay. I mean, I, lo I, love, I love the courses. Uh, for instance, uh, in <laughs> when, they, when they, they said, you have to take an ecology course here, uh, because I had taken... Uh, some ecology course, or, and uh, I remember uh, Francis Rose was this really, really fabulous professor. He had this huge sense of humor. And so he said, the principle of the niche means that two, because it, what it, the, the principle of the niche in, in regular terms means that only one species can, can fit into there. Uh, because they compete and, and then they separate out and they figure out two different, you know, it, it's, it's uh, 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 cooperation, not competition that survives. He said, this is the way to think about it. Any two species can exist in one niche as long as one of them isn't there. So I wrote that. <laughs> for they obviously do not have a sense of humor. <laughs> you have to take, uh, so there I am taking it. <laughs> I mean that yeah that makes sense to me I don't know. Right? <laughs> um, yeah but that that's you know I mean that and that's one thing I did find is that the people in West Texas have this really dry sense of humor uh, and, and and they have a lot of very colorful expressions uh, <laughs> uh, which was which was great I love that. Yeah I mean humor to match the landscape, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, poor old Lubbock, they said that uh, someone could go uh, AWOL from the Air Force Base there and two days later they'd still see him <laughs> where he was walking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I drove. Well, you I'm, know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that, or earlier you briefly mentioned that you felt more racial tension when you went up to New York as opposed to <clears throat> Brownsville? Yes. Um, <clears throat> For instance, uh, when I uh, applied, well, I, 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 would, I would go down, I was looking for an apartment. Well, the thing is that I, I, um, I got there late because I, got, uh, I was let go from basic training in September. That was when I was out, and the, the, the courses started in August. So I was, I, I, the first semester, I could. I would only did like uh, research projects. I didn't take any courses uh, because I, I, I arrived there late. So I stayed with a with a buddy of mine. Who the guy ended up 
becoming my best man, Chuck Kugler, later on. And I mean, I was sleeping out in the porch. And so I would go down, in those days there was no internet, so I would go downtown and wait for the uh, newspaper to come out, and buy the newspaper, look at the one ads, f find a place and go over and talk to the people and rent it. So I <clears throat> found a place, I went down, uh, because it was not too far away, I went over there and I talked to the lady and I gave her a deposit and I said, okay, this is, I'm gonna, this is my, gonna be my apartment, it's a little one bedroom place downtown Ithaca and so okay so I go up the next day I get a phone call from uh, some human services commission from the state of New York saying why did you take that apartment didn't you know this black woman came in there and, and uh, was going to, to get it and she deserves it and all that and I said hey have you ever heard of Chicanos Mexican Americans and they said, no. I said, well, you're talking to one right now, <laughs> and we are a minority also. Oh, really? And so, you know, but anyway, it's what, uh, that, that, was, that was just part of it. Uh, uh, after that, um, I, didn't, I didn't feel, I mean, that, that was just part of, of the deal. Most of, 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 of the, um, uh, I would say, turmoil, I would feel up there was because of uh, what was happening with the civil rights uh, era uh, actions and things like that uh, and I mean I didn't get caught up in anything I mean there was uh, uh, an armed takeover of the student union at Cornell in I think it was uh, right before I got there where the students actually you know went up there with guns and things and and were you know were ready to start the revolution but um, I didn't, I, I, I was too busy doing my science stuff. <clears throat> so what did your family think about you going so far away, first from Lubbock and then going to New York? Uh, well, since my dad had traveled, you know, in World War II, it, it wasn't a big deal with him. And my mom uh, never, has never, never traveled, and it was up to Mexico City for her honeymoon, and that was the only place she ever went. Uh, before, before you know, before I left, so she didn't know, and besides, she had all my other brothers and sisters to take care of. So I mean, I was just like, okay, bye. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't an issue, you know, with with my with my mother or uh, or my father. Okay. Um. So earlier I asked about mentors. Mm -hmm. um, did if if not necessarily mentors, were there people that actively discouraged you that you kind of turned around and took inspiration? Um, <clears throat> when I was a senior in high school, the counselor gave us a, gave us tests, you know, dexterity tests and I guess IQ tests. And in the dexterity test, I did real well, and I distinct, I remember, because I, this really made me angry. He said, you know what? You're real good with your hands. You should be a mechanic like your dad. And that, and I said, I mean, I thought, I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, you know, no, I want, I want, I don't want to just be a mechanic. I want to be something else. I want to be a professor. That's what I, I mean, because I was like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's the only incidence that I remember of anybody, you know, trying to dissuade me from doing, you know, going on to, uh, to become a, you know, get my PhD. So at that point, had you already, I guess, articulated to yourself that you wanted to be a professor? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I think, well, I started reading before, kin before well, there wasn't any kindergarten. Uh, I started, what, and this is, this is really strange. When I was three or four, my parents would take me to HEB, okay? Uh, and since I was kind, kind of older than my little brothers, who were like tiny babies, they would park me 
by the comic book stand. And th in those days, there was these stands of comic books. And so I would sit there and look at the comic books. And while my parents shopped and they came back and they'd pick me up, I wouldn't move. And I, I knew that there was something going on because there was these little bubbles, you know, with, with uh, hieroglyphics at that point. And, and so I could follow the action. Uh, uh, and they would, every once in a while, they would buy me one. Uh, so I would take it home and, and then I would try to, try to figure out what they were saying and things like that. Uh, and, and so I started, uh, I started being literate. I mean, not, maybe not reading, but looking at graphic images and, and writing and stuff and knowing that there was meaning in there, that there was power in there. And so um, by the time I got into, uh, into third or fourth grade, I was like reading way ahead of everybody. Just because I had that, I wanted to do that. I had the desire to do it. Uh, and when, uh, like I said, you know, when I was in, um, in uh, high school, I was like, I was reading books uh, as, uh, like I said, every two days I would finish a science fiction book. And I also, was uh, a thespian, uh, and uh, I, because I would when I would read, I would do the accent of whoever, wh like for instance, in I forgot which one, which book it was, To Kill a Mockingbird, I think, or in um, what's the other one, uh, Huckleberry Finn, they actually talk. I mean, he writes in the accent of what. So I would say that to myself, and I would say, how would how would that person talk? And um, so, uh, so then I, I joined the, uh, the uh, thespian club at Brownsville High School, and I was um, in, in the, oh man, I could have, could have gone to all state, but no, the, the other guys weren't. I got all district, but I didn't, I didn't make all state as far as acting is concerned, you know, expounding and stuff like that. And I love poetry and uh, Bob Dylan. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, I got, I, I got it, and all of that said, you know what? Uh, no law, no uh, medicine, no uh, teaching. Yep, university. Yep, that's where I'm going. So that's where I went. Nice. <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, being a professor yourself, you must be able to look back maybe on your education, and <clears throat> did you? Were you aware of any inequalities, I guess, in like Brownsville education versus somewhere like Lubbock or Austin or up in New York? As far as as far as I was concerned, no. Um, what I did notice was that in in Brownsville. A lot of a lot of my friends, who who didn't who sank. Never made it up out of there. Uh, the ones who swam, we did great, but the sinkers, I mean, they they there was no help for them. Uh, they, I mean, they just, you know, they. I, if whether it was, I don't think it was their fault. I think it was the fault of the system that didn't reach down and help them uh, learn how. To, to, to handle the English language. Uh, I didn't, I mean, by the time we, I got to Lubbock, uh, in, in, in the university, well, there was huge, we had huge classes. I had 500 in the English class. Um, I, I didn't see any of this discrimination or difference in quality or anything. But I thought I was real, I was well prepared for at least to handle Lubbock, but not to handle Cornell. There I was, I always felt like I was like, man, I was always struggling and struggling. And I, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, when you're competing with, uh, with other students who have uh, gone to, you know, uh, preparatory schools and all that, it's, it, it gets, and coming, you know, from, <laughs> from the border, uh, you have to work doubly hard but you know what was neat is that when 
the other graduate students, they could do the computers, they could do the math, and they could do all this, you know, statistics and stuff like that. But when we got out there in the field, because we had trucks and we would go out and sample and stuff like that, they were like, what do we do now? I said, ah, no problem. See that tree over there? Da, da, da. You just go over to that one over there. That's about 100 meters. Uh, I was able to do stuff in the field that they could do in, only in the lab. And so uh, uh, thank goodness that I did all that stuff down here in Brownsville, running outside and, and hunting and fishing. Uh, and that, that helped. In other words, I filled a, a need for them, and they, they help, we helped each other. Interesting dynamic. Um, so why do you think that the, you said that the people that sank, that they had, like obviously it was a part of the system right. that was failing them. Why do you think that system was failing them? Because I think that uh, the attitude back then was, oh, thank you, uh, the attitude then was you had to learn English. Uh, and if you didn't learn English, then you were obviously not, um, not valued. You were, you were not, there was something wrong with you. And uh, so you were expendable. If you you know, and and I think that's that attitude is still around. That uh, there was something wrong with you. And and I think that that's uh, it's wrong because these. Uh, I mean, I I know my friend uh, Jesus Castillo moved to El Paso. Uh, was I mean this guy was smart. He could figure things out. Uh, but he just couldn't handle the language, and he, I think he, the, the high. I mean, he he had a pretty good. I mean, he, I think he's passed away now. He had a pretty good life. He became, he was a janitor at one of the schools. You know, I mean, and which is a I mean, that's a good career, uh, a steady and all that. But he could have. I mean, I think that if he had been helped, he could have become something. You know. Has his own cleaning business or something. I don't know, but anyway, it's the it's it's the the sinkers uh, that I, I well at least him that I remember, you know, having it, and I thought that the system was not fair. Do you can you think of any ways specifically that the system could have helped? Well, uh, in today's world, we we know that there are that there's things like uh, autism and Asperger's and things like that. Uh, you know, uh, dyslexia, uh, and so the, the the in today's new uh, wor world, where we th those we know that those are real problems, and I think that maybe that, that if those children had been you know helped with the, with a new prog the programs we have today. I think that that's 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 a reaction to to what happened back then, the the new programs with you know with with uh, special education needs. We didn't. I mean, we didn't have special ed. We were all thrown together. You know, back you know back in the old days. So, I I think that 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 uh, the uh, they're working to to try to solve it today, in 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 schools. So, do you think? that South Texas Border Initiative helped in that, um, I mean, since then, and has improved, uh, it, things it, like that? It, it, it must have, because things are better today. I mean, things are, uh, there is more opportunities and more help for, uh, for, for, uh, for the, the, the growing demographic of Hispanics with the with the South Texas Border Initiative, because it it's it's recognizing that that the people in uh, the Rio Grande Valley and all along the border actually are a valuable resource that the United States needs is going to need when we start to have more and deeper relations with the rest of Latin America, uh, and uh, I mean, or even even here in the United States. 
the talent and uh, intelligence and hardworking ability of the of the people from the border uh, is, I, and I think this the South Texas Initiative is just a first step in trying to to harness that energy and um, and and ability uh, to to try to to have the United States uh, or you know work toward becoming. A more successful country by tapping into this this type of talent, you know. So I, I yeah, I, th I, th I think that it is it is a good, uh, at, at least a first step. I don't know what the next steps are really, but <laughs> we're. I mean, it's it's working. I mean, it's it's starting. Do you think that the this initiative would have happened on its own? Like no, 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 it would not have happened on its own. Uh, any initiative like this has to come from people feeling injustices and people realizing that there is a better way. Uh, when, when we look back at uh, the history of, for example, the Rio Grande Valley with the Texas Rangers, uh, you know, taking or, or shooting people, and and then all the the lynchings and uh, all of this uh, social injustices lead uh, uh, people, uh, and, and because I, Hispanics are no different than any other people. When you f when they find injustices, they say, "How can we fix this?" The system is set up in the United States based on the Constitution that all men are created equal. And men, of course, means men and women. That we start being equal. And so if we don't recognize that, I mean, if, when, when, you're, when you're downtrodden and you look and you say, that's where we want to go. So how can we fix this? We need to organize. There is, there's no way that any single person can do it. So the, the organization of things like uh, the Border Initiative are a result of past injustices that are now funneling toward toward moving toward justice. So why do you think these injustices I guess I guess exist or uh, because uh, okay <laughs> I'm gonna get philosophical here. When the human species was originating and coming out of or forming ourselves, there was always these little bands, and within the band you cooperated, okay? But there was always these slackers who said, you know what, if I do this, if I do that, there's always people who'd want to take advantage of the cooperation and get stuff for themselves. And so it's a, it's a basic human uh, reaction to whenever a system is working that you try to take advantage of the system. Every, I mean, everybody does that. Uh, and so to, because the, the more advantage that you have, that means that your family is gonna survive into the future, okay? Uh, and so uh, the self-sacrificing uh, of cooperation and all that, that's with us also. And, uh, and so when we start moving into uh, legislation and laws and things to try to make thing make the system fairer, more fair for more people, then that's the result. I mean that this this is a result of of that movement that we understand that we're that uh, in order for uh, for the m maximum number of people to cooperate, there has to be laws and there has to be regulations to, because other, otherwise people would just run off and you know slack slack it as much as they can I mean, it's, it's, it's natural you know so that's why I think that that those uh, uh, the systems uh, are put in so that we can we can have a, 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 a society that tries to, to maximize the benefit for the most number of people. But, it, it, but it's not going to happen on its own. So what do you think are some steps that could be taken to keep that initiative going? 
Well, in, in the U.S. right now, the system is set up so that people have power of the vote. And if we can get more people, the more people that register to vote, the more people that uh, actually get out to vote, the more fair the system is for voting, I think that that's going to uh, help a lot. And then if we have candidates who are in running uh, for office not to enrich themselves but to help with the social situation, I think that that's, that's a second thing that can help. Uh, when, we, you know, when we're running people who are... Um, just in it for their own. I mean, yes, because you ha you're going to have a lot of power. You're going to affect a huge number of people if you if you do get elected. Uh, then you end up. I mean, you know, uh, you, you, there has to be this uh, integrity of the person that the, that what they're trying, what they're representing is a group of people, and they're trying to bring benefits to that group, not for themselves. I think those are two 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 major things that that can that can help. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Well said. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a separate vein, but when when you finished your doctorate at Cornell, mm -hmm. what made you want to come back to Texas? Um, I always wanted to come back to Texas. I mean, I I've, I've always felt that this is my home. Uh, this is the uh, this is the area where I could feel that a lot of of, of we have this hu huge brain drain of these people, especially like in my class uh, or in my area, who got their degree and then left, and then they're leaving everybody back there who helped support them. And the, and, the, and the system in the lurch, and then things, things are never going to improve if everybody leaves. And um, I, I mean, that was, a, that was a, the era where we had um, the Peace Corps being, a, you know, being a very uh, popular thing for people to, to, to go off and, tr and, and to try to do uh, social justice programs with your training. And so I said, well, what, what better place to do my, any of this type of social justice than back in my hometown? Why should I go, you know, I mean, or back, back in Texas? And uh, so my, my first job that I could get back in Texas was this Texas A&M at uh, College Station as the, the, uh, <clears throat> the state level leader for entomology programs uh, in urban areas. It, it was an exciting time. It was great. I, I, I love being there. Uh, uh, did I tell you there was one time? My job was to handle uh, insect problems dealing with cities and houses and all that. I had this one time we got, I got called in from um, Children's Hospital. I think it was in Galveston. And uh, they were having problems with ants, and the ants were invading the hospital rooms. And these are pharaoh ants, which, which are not uh, sugar feeders. They feed on proteins. And so what they would do is they would, when people would have like open heart surgery, they would have like, you know, these, these where they would sew them up the wounds, and they would put, you know, a dressing on it. And then the ants would go underneath the dressing and feed on the uh, on the, the blood plasma that come, so they would take off the dressing and they would be outlined in ants uh, which was not, <laughs> not did not make happy campers so so um, they, I mean with the ants the ants weren't bringing in any germs or and besides the germs that were there in the hospital anyway so we came in and they said oh my god we've got all these people in there what are we going to do and I said well there's no and, uh, it, and I remember, follow the ants. And so we would follow them and follow them. And there was this one section where they had put a new part of the hospital and joined it, and they didn't seal it well. 
So that's where the ants are getting in. So we t I took care of that. That was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that way you're getting set up for some big lawsuits. <laughs> Oh, oh but and then another uh, problem that I, that I had, oh, this poor lady in Conroe, um, she, uh, and, and this is very common. It's getting more and more common now, where people have uh, insect phobia, entomophobia, uh, where they think that they have insects crawling on them. They have insects in their furniture. They have insects. This lady was taking her children, and and. Uh, preparing a bathtub full of insecticides. She would sprinkle insecticide and then she would dip her children in there like that because she, she was saying that they're covered with bugs. I'm feeling them. It's a psychological condition. She said they're everywhere on me and they're all in there and they're here. And then she, was, she would uh, take tape and then send it to me. You know, and I would look at the microscope. And so finally, I took the microscope and the tape and everything over the, to her house, showed her. Look, it's just fuzz. Here you can look. No, it's, it's they've ran away. <laughs> they got out of the out of the tape. And so anyway, so uh, I don't know what. I mean, uh, human services or protect child protective services had to take over after. I couldn't explain to her, but uh, that is very common now. It's getting more and more common with uh, with uh, I, I, I guess. In, in different areas of, the, of, in New York, for example, New York City, and in, uh, I think, in Chapel Hill, places like that, where, where people are calling in th that they have entomophobia. Well, they don't call it entomophobia, but they have bug problems. Yeah. So th those are some of the things that I helped work on when I was at a &E. But um, then we decided, my wife and I decided, well, you know what, it's, we, uh, we really sh shouldn't raise our kids here. It's far away from the family. My wife is an orphan. And so we said, well, if we move to Brownsville, I've got all this family. I've got a cousins and brothers and sisters. and So we moved on there, and everybody moved away. So we <laughs> but we, got, we, 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 we made it work for 35 years living down there. Then we retired, uh, moved up here to Austin, because our kids were going to say, well, we're going to all go to Austin. Okay, well, we'll be there. So we moved up here, and we're still here. I've, I feel that I fit in better to Austin than, than down in the valley in the sense that I don't have to explain to people what uh, recycling is. Why, why, are you, why are you throwing that stuff in your car? Don't you just throw it out the window? You know, stuff like that. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um. <laughs> So your wife was fully supportive of moving back yes. down to Brownsville, and yes, uh huh, yeah. She she's from Connecticut, and um, we met at Cornell, uh, and then and we came to to College Station, um, and she didn't really like College Station. Uh, there was you know, it, it's a very well, but and especially back then it was very very conservative military type thinking and so we said and we, and we were like you know just like the hippie generation coming out of Cornell and she she went to she was at Woods well she was on the way to Woodstock <laughs> but the, her she and her friends in their Volkswagen Beetle got turned away <laughs> because the mud was too, too bad or whatever uh, uh, so anyway so we uh, we kind of didn't fit <laughs> To uh, to A and M and you know back then so we said well let's go down to the valley you know and 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 we were both uh, Roman Catholics and there's a, a lot of Roman Catholic Catholicism down there as, so, as opposed to the Protestants but now we've become we switched over and become Episcopalians English Catholics <laughs> so anyway so she went down there she learned Spanish. And she got a degree in, uh, she got a master's in counseling and an RN, all down there in, the, in, uh, in Brownsville. So then she was a school nurse for a, the longest time. But, you know, I mean, but she's happy, she's happy here in Austin. You know, the thing is that uh, if you're happy with yourself, you'll be happy anywhere, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're unhappy, you're going to be unhappy no matter where you are. 
And it's because, it, you know, it just depends on what, how you feel about your, your own self. So we're happy. <laughs> That's good. So you said you guys obviously moved down to Brownsville because you, family was an important thing yeah. for you. So how, how, would you have wanted your own kids to go to, say, UTRGV, or did they? Or? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, no, I didn't want them to go to UTRGV. Uh, it's too local. UTRGV serves a purpose for uh, kids who are the first generation to get to go to college. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, you know, I mean, the, uh, to me that's its main purpose, is to provide an opportunity for, um, for, for students who could never have gone to college but who have the intelligence, the drive, and the time to go to college there so they don't have to go very far uh, away. Uh, no, my, my son came to UT and my daughter went to Brown. So we, you know, we encourage them to, to, to go, you know, out of, out of, you know, the local area. Uh, it, it's always good to, it's, all, like, it's like me, you know, it's always good to go away, <laughs> right? Why stay there? <laughs> you already know that place. So what were some of the trade-offs of moving back down to Brownsville? <sighs> the main trade-off was that uh, my career was, um, I mean, I, w I went from a major university to a junior college. So my career just took a nosedive as far as the earning ability and the advancement. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess if I, earned, if I wanted to earn more money, I could have gone into administration, but that's not, that's not my, my, my game. Uh, I, I'm happiest most when I'm performing in front of a class. It's a performance. Uh, you have your script and you have your timing and you have, you know, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, voices and, and accents and stories and things like that. that that's what I'm best at. Uh, and so I wanted to stay where I was good at, not to be move up to where I ended up, you know, moving up to my level of incompetence, which I could have. But I decided that I'm, yeah, and so that was one of the trade-offs. The other trade-off is that Brownsville is so far away from anywhere. Hardly anybody could come to visit us because it's like, I mean, it's in, it's close, uh, Dallas is closer to Chicago than it is to Brownsville. So people, people, all our friends would, you know, I mean, to get down to there, I mean, it's, it really takes an effort. So very few people, uh, well, not very few, but, you know, and, and, to, and then to get out of there, it was uh, dry. We would drive in the summer to go visit uh, my wife's uh, sister in Connecticut, uh, and uh, it would. That yeah, was that was a summer long trip, you know, driving all the way up there and then back down. But hey, we got to see the we got to see the U.S. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the level of Poverty and ignorance, I'm not saying ignorance in the sense of, of stupidity, the, of, of not knowing how things work, uh, of not knowing things like uh, recycling and, and stuff like that, is uh, because the, uh, the people who are living there are only thinking day to day. They're, they're, not, they're not thinking long range, you know. Uh, they're, they're in, in a situation, and I understand the situation, they're in a situation where uh, they have, they don't know where in the next month's money is going to come from. They're only worried about this. They know they're going to get some this week and that's it. So uh, as far as like thinking about recycling and uh, solar power and the future and things like that, it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, because of the of, of the economic situation that, that they're in, 
but they, they sure are, but you know, but what's great about those people is that they'll give you whatever they have. They'll, they'll, they're the, they're the most generous people, even though they have nothing. And I think that's, that's, that's really, that's really one of the, one of the, the, the beauties of that area. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So is, I guess, one of the things or reasons that you moved back down to Brownsville, were you hoping to kind of, the only word coming to mind is alleviate some of that ignorance and yes, expand? exactly. To serve as a role model and serve as an example that if I can get out of there and go, you know, to uh, even a, bi a big shot university like Cornell, that they could do it also, and uh, I had I had you know I had a pretty good success at that. Uh, it's that that was the the main the, the main my main reason for moving down there. Besides, you know, having my children learn to be bilingual and, and bicultural, but um, basically that that was the, that was to me that was the deal. I was going to go down there and live by example, you know, show them by example by living, you know, uh, at at a level, at a different, in a, in a different way than, than what they're used to. I, I mean, I was considered a weirdo, but well, hey, that's okay, you know? Because <laughs> I would walk instead of drive my car. I rode my, I rode my bicycle for years and years and years. I rode my bicycle. What are you riding a bicycle for, you know? Only poor people ride bicycles, you know? Uh, but I had fancy bicycles <laughs> till I fell off and hit the curb and broke my hip and now I have a hip replacement. <laughs> hey, it's a price to pay, but that's okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so is, I guess, so you said you wanted your kids to be bilingual, so is bilingual education now more, uh, I guess, prevalent in Brownsville? I, you know, I don't know, um, but what is prevalent, I, and I'm, I'm not, it's, not, it's not the classroom education, it's the uh, social interactions that they have, um, that, that where you learn to be bilingual, uh, either in the sports arena or in band or in, you know, just... Uh, Going across well in those in those days we used to just drive across to Mexico, um, to Matamoros. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, of a social situation where you learn to speak the other language. It, little kids playing, uh, you know, talking to uh, older people. It's. It, you know, people who, who are recent migrants. So uh, it, it's not really in the education system that they learn the second language. Unless it's English is your second language, like me. So um, I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this. Um, I guess. So what's the timeline of your higher education, I guess? Where did, like, your service in the National Guard fit in? And okay, so I was, um, I was a senior at Tech when my draft number came up. In those days, they had uh, draft numbers, and so I came home at the very first draft, and everybody said, sit down. What do you mean, sit down? Sit down. So I, so I sat down and said, the draft numbers just came up. Mine was, two, they said two, mine was 200, mine was 300, mine was 150, and yours was 59. So I was, I was, I was going to get drafted to go to Vietnam. And, um, but one of the other graduates, uh, the, uh, one of the graduate students said, hey, they're looking for people at the National Guard right down the street here. Why don't you go over there and join? And that way you could stay in the U.S. You don't have to go to Vietnam. So I said, okay. So I went and joined. And as soon as I graduated in 1970, yeah, 
I didn't even go, I didn't even go to graduation. I couldn't because I was on my way to basic training. Uh, I just, I, I mean, I didn't even, I didn't walk, I didn't, with, you know, with a robe or anything. I was on the way to basic training. And then I came back to Lubbock, but since uh, I had, I knew I was going to, to, to go to Cornell, so I wrote to the people, uh, to, uh, it was in Corning, New York. I wrote to them and I said, I'm going to be trans, I'm going to be going to graduate school in Cornell, can I transfer into your unit? So they said, okay, well, come on, you know, yes, you can, la, da, da, here's, here's the deal. You talk to Sergeant Zito. So I, it's, this was now September, so I drive up there and I drive down to, Cornell, to Corning and I get to uh, talk to Sergeant, I forgot his first name, his last name was Zito. And he said, hey, we don't need no infantry guys here. He said, um, but I'll tell you what, he said, we're, we're an engineering unit, we're a construction unit. I said, oh boy, do I learn, can I learn how to drive a, like a bulldozer or something? He said, no. He said, let me give you a test. I said, okay. And he said, have you ever cut a lettuce in half? Yeah. Have you ever opened a can of beans? Yeah. You're a cook. <laughs> so I passed, and they made me a cook because I passed the test. <laughs> so there, I, for the next however many years I was in the National Guard, I was a cook. So uh, I, uh, I, Every month, I would go down to Corning. I had, there were some other friends who, uh, who uh, uh, other National Guardsmen in Ithaca, and we drove down the 50 miles, 40 miles, or whatever it was, to Corning, New York, and went to, 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 the, to the meetings, monthly meetings. And then during the summer, that's when I would go to base, I mean, to uh, what it was, guard duty, two weeks of guard duty. And then when I, uh, my last year, uh, I transferred to a unit, an airborne unit in uh, College Station. So uh, I finished up the last year at College Station. Again, you know, just once a month and then uh, two weeks in the summer. So, I, again, as a cook. <laughs> so how long were you in College Station? A year. Just a year? Yeah. Yeah, just a year. And then you moved down then to Then I moved Brownsville? down to Brownsville. Yeah, there, okay. was, uh, there was a death uh, down there. One, uh, one of the professors died, and so they opened up the. The, uh, they said they had uh, the, the the position. They said they had like 300 applicants, but since the uh, the head of the department knew me, Mrs. Warburton, she said, "Oh, we'll just hire this guy. We know." See, because she said, "You know, the thing is, we hire people from other parts of uh, the United States, and they come down to Brownsville, and they can't take it, because it is a culture shock." moving into a total, you know, where you have 94% Hispanic. And uh, Spanish is like the dominant language. Uh, you have all this poverty and uh, the attitude of the people there is different than, uh, than, than the rest of the United States. And so when other uh, faculty gets, get hired down there, either they don't like it or their spouse doesn't like it. And so then they, within a year or two, they're gone. So she said, no, we're going to hire the homeboy. So here we are. <laughs> so, and I stayed there for 35 years. So, it, you know, she, she was right. <laughs> so what spurned the move to Austin? Just Oh, it was a central location because my, uh, my children uh, didn't, uh, were looking for better opportunities that are down in the Rio Grande Valley. And my son was in Dallas, and my daughter was in law school in uh, Houston, and she said, and we said, well, Austin is kind of central, so we'll, we'll, we'll move to Austin, and then from there we'll, uh, we, you know, we can everybody can visit or we can move, and, and and luckily now my daughter has found a job here, uh, downtown with uh, uh, Richard Richards Rodriguez and Skeeth, so she's an attorney downtown, and uh, we take care of our grandson. It's the wonderful, it's the most beautiful job in the whole world. It's taking care of your little little grandchildren. I, you're too young yet, but it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> so was it a hard transition or were there trade-offs for you from going? Moving up here, yes. Uh, the traffic, of course, uh, is much worse here 
Um, the uh, house prices are triple what we have, well, you know, what the land values are in, in Brownsville. Uh, the um, pollen, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, but other than that, you know, the, the, you know, and then the pollen doesn't affect me a whole lot. I mean, it does a little, but, you know, just <laughs> uh, the, and the traffic, eh, I've, I've learned to, you know, I like um, to wait till it's, you know, or, or certain times I don't drive between, say, well, I have to drive. If you drive between 7.30 and 8, it's jam-packed. But if you wait to 8.15, for some reason, the, you know, at least the secondary roads are, are clear. So if you wait a little while, and so I've set up my schedule so I, I take, care, take advantage of the, the lower traffic situation. Um, the house prices, not much you can do about it, you know, just grin and bear it. <laughs> so you, I, I'm assuming you're enjoying uh, St. Edwards University oh, then yes. and teaching there? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. I, I'll tell you a story about from Carlos Castaneda, okay. Uh, he said that there are four enemies to become a man of knowledge, because what his deal is, he was studying the Yaqui Indians, in, I, and I know a lot of people consider him a fake and all that, but, but his original book, The Teachings of Don Juan, uh, talk about what Don Juan taught him, and one of the things he taught him is to become a man of knowledge. That means that you have, you are now entering a different world, and so you have to conquer your fear, the first uh, fear of new things, of learning, fear of knowledge, you know, of learning new things. And once you conquer your fear, then you, ha then you have clarity because you see where you're going to go. And the, but the problem of seeing where you're going to go is that you, you're only focused in one direction. So yes, you can see clearly, but you can be surprised from the side. So you can't fall into that. And if, you, if you're fearless and you see clearly, then you have power. Because people come and tell you, you can see things you, that we tell me what to do, and if you fall, enemy, if you fall, if you stop at any one of these three, then you never become a true man of knowledge. And the fourth enemy is old age. He's, and he said, because by the time you conquer those three enemies, you're old, and you want to give up. You just want to play golf, or you want to sit on the porch and rock and all that. And he says. And you can't because it's taking you this long to, to become a man of knowledge. And so now you have to give back. And so that's why I'm there. I'm giving back. I'm working on the future for you and everybody else who's young so that the young people that are going to go out and become powerful in a political situations or business situations or whatever, marketing, whatever, they are now, I am helping them make their future decisions based on the scientific method. And that's my goal in life right now, is to have these people. I, I mean, this is the, uh, the influencing of what I believe is, is a pos more positive future by having uh, the respect that science requires be instilled in, in the students who are non-science majors. So that's why I'm there, and I'm, I'm having a great time. So I'm, I'm guessing that you're never going to want to stop teaching. Right. Not <laughs> until I fall over. They're going to have to drag me out. <laughs> I'll put little uh, spurs there so they can drag me. <laughs> <laughs> so are you hoping to influence your grandson perhaps? Oh yes, scientific. of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know, he's, his, he comes from a very musical family. His, his dad has uh, at least one Latin Grammy that I know of, so. And this guy is, I mean, you know what his favorite video is? <laughs> Beethoven's Ninth. He, 
He will not let me show him any other video. He wants to see Beethoven's Ninth, and he has his little baton, and he conducts. Wow, <laughs> that is... He's a year and a half. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know. So, uh, it's, it's just, you know, so, anyway, <laughs> he's going to be his own person. I'm, I'm just, just there to support him. Wow. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you said that you married a fellow student from Cornell yes. and that your wife is from Connecticut. Uh -huh. Had she ever been to Texas? No. No? No. But um, she did have, she had been, to, um, her, she had an aunt in Wyoming. And so she, when she was a, a child, she and her mother would ride the bus through Chicago and then o or over to Wyoming. And so she knew about horses and sheep and uh, cattle and antelope and dogs and all that type of stuff. So she, 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 was, she was more Western than me. <laughs> Even though she's from the East, East Coast. Um, so she wasn't Latina. So what did she think about conditions in Texas? Did she see? Uh, she, uh, yes, she saw things. She, for example, she worked at, uh, as um, in Planned Parenthood in uh, College Station, and she worked in a building downtown. And she told me she saw where they had scrubbed off uh, white women only in the building for one of the uh, uh, water fountains. Or white white people only, for the for the water fountains, and she was like, "What? Wait a minute! <laughs> you know, didn't didn't we take care of this during the Civil War?" Uh, and so she was yes, she is uh, she was uh, uh, fairly disappointed with the, the <laughs> racism that's around here. And then she and she also uh, uh, encountered, uh, you know, I mean, she she had some 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 problems. In uh, in uh, in Brownsville because she's almost six feet tall, so and everybody's <laughs> small. So they were, they were the the she did play soccer internationally in Matamoros. So uh, and they wanted her to be the center forward because she was <laughs> big, and it, it was great going over there and watching her and and her. She had a bunch of friends uh, that would go over and play uh, the soccer. That's why she has problems with her shoulder to get falling on that side. Um, but they would play in the stadium and, and they, uh, everybody was just, uh, I mean, the, all the women were really, well, they were competitive, but they were, afterwards they were very, very nice and everything. So she, she fit in pretty well, you know, very well, I, think, I would say, especially after she, I mean, she did learn Spanish and everything. Yeah, very, I mean, it's a great deal. That, and there was even one time when the uh, the soccer team from Matamoros, the Coca, I think it was Coca Cola, was their sponsor, would not they the uh, our our border patrol would not let them cross. So what they did is they swam the river and came over and played a soccer game after, after they changed clothes. <laughs> that, that's, that's how that's how you do things in in the valley. <laughs> Okay, no, all right, we'll, 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 we'll get over there. <laughs> yeah. That's admirable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't, I never know who, who won or whatever. I, I, I took my, my son and my daughter over there and we'd, they would run in the stadium and we'd eat, you know, the chips with the hot sauce on it. And I never even took, I even kept score. <laughs> we were just having a good time. Um. So, I guess, wh what about Austin? What do you guys both think of Austin comparatively to? Uh, Austin is um, much more connected to the rest of the world. Brownsville is kind of like secluded, and it's in its own pocket of, of existence in that uh, you have to really appreciate Hispanic culture to be part of that area there. In Austin, it's like um, uh, much more open. You're much more diverse, you're, and you're much more 
connected to uh, what's happening in Europe and in South America and, 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 and even the rest of the United States. So uh, um, I'm, I consider myself not so much a citizen of Texas as a citizen of planet Earth. You know, and so it often fits more into that mindset. Uh, like I said, we don't have to explain about uh, composting, and we don't have to explain that we ripped out all the grass in our yard and planted plants. And, you know, like, and we have two uh, curved uh, raised beds in the front yard for vegetables and things instead of grass. We don't have to say, in Austin, that's not weird. That's like, oh, you're progressive, you know? And so that, that, you know, that's the type of thing that's great about Austin. Okay, well, so what do you think the future of the border region higher education programs are? <sighs> or I guess, what does the future hold for them? <laughs> uh, I think that overall, with the uh, systems, uh, if, if you look at, at overall systems in, 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 uh, on the planet, things are getting so complicated that there's going to be a reduction in, uh, in, in toward uh, a push toward more simplicity. And one of the things that's going to happen is that universities are going to shrink. They're going to uh, come back to being uh, to smaller institutions. Um, uh, it's it to me it's in, unsustainable how much money we're paying out uh, we're spending all this money on uh, a huge amount of money on administration and not so much teaching uh, and so the border is uh, is probably going to have one you know and that's it's happening we used to have UT Brownsville and UT uh, Pan American in Edinburgh and now they're one and so it's going to it's going to keep consolidating like that, uh, and and uh, and that the 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 amount of money that UT or any university is going to be funneling away from the central campus is going to be reduced. So it seems to me that the border area better get set to have a shrinkage and to have the students funneled up to here. Uh, there's going to be. Uh, even uh, and and the and the th but the thing is that th the counterbalance of that is that you have this growing Hispanic population down there. So those children are going to need to have education, uh, and the the money is go is shrinking down there. I mean, you know, the, we're getting less money from from oil. It's not going to 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 increase very much. It's probably going to stabilize around $60 a barrel. So the money is shrinking, the population is growing, and they're going to have, we're going to have a funnel to have them come up here. Uh, or there's going to be a, a huge need, for example, uh, second thing, is there's going to be a big need for technical programs. So uh, the junior colleges there who, who are existing are going to be producing uh, people who are uh, adept at auto mechanics and carpentry and pl plumbing and uh, you know repair systems, things that you can't outsource. That's to me th those type of technical jobs for two-year programs are going. That's where the the the, the focus should be. Uh, there's going to be a lot of need for those type of people, and and they can be very successful. You can do that and then move on up, and if you or move up to here and finish your education, you know, if if you want to go on and, and become, uh, you know, like a, a medical doctor or, or you know, a professor, or an attorney, or whatever, the the, the path is open. But you, now you have a basis of earning some, some earning a living, and then doing, doing that, this secondary movement. So, uh, I think that there's going to be a shrinkage of the uh, uh, educational opportunity, higher educational opportunities in the valley. <laughs> that, that's my viewpoint. 
I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I'm right or not, but that's, that's what I see happening. So if that happens, do you think it's just going to be the same scenario where th people try to get, to keep the momentum the South Texas Border Initiative has given them going, or? Well, it's, it, they're going to require, uh, I, you know, it, if that momentum is going to be sustained, it's going to require some money. Uh, money is, is, is the big, motiva mo mo big factor in this uh, initiative. Uh, and if, if uh, the money is shrinking, uh, I don't know what the, what, the, uh, what the people, how the people who are in South Texas or along the border can influence the legislature up here in, in Austin unless the people down there vote. If they don't vote, then these people uh, up over here, they're going to say, well, they don't vote, so why should we take care of them? And so it, in order to keep the South Texas Initiative going, there has to be some type of political organizational skills taught to the people that are managing this so they can get more people organized, more people voting, more people uh, lobbying up here so that we can keep this going. Otherwise, all you're going to have is a huge number of people with no, no skills. And what do you do then? Um, well, I don't know. I guess they could join the Army. You know? Yeah. And, uh, but that's, I mean, yeah, they could, but uh, it, it's a, I mean, uh, well, the Army is, is it, I mean, it's okay, but, it, you know, the other, you forget that, that there's, there's also bullets coming your way. And, you know, you could just get unlucky and boom, there goes one. So, <sighs> I don't know. I, th I think that the, that the, the, the social situation is such that um, voting rights have uh, and they're, they're have to not be suppressed like they are across Texas. Uh, somehow we're going to have to um, increase the voting rights for, the, for, for to allow more people to vote. Maybe uh, when you register for your driver's license you can register you automatically register to vote is one one way uh, another is to move the elections out of a Tuesday into a weekend so that people don't have to choose between going to work or going to vote that is all it is it's politics it's what what will eventually solve this problem well is there anything else that you'd like to add or that you think I've forgotten to ask hmm Gosh, I mean, it's been, <laughs> I've been blabbing away. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything right now. Uh, uh, what did, we talked about most of the stuff that I've done. Uh, no, that's, that's about it, as far as I can tell. Well, all right. I believe that concludes our interview. Um, thank you. This thank was... An Thank amazing you, interview. <laughs>